Welcome everyone to our relatively cool lecture hall, L1, probably the best lecture hall we've got at University of Oxford. Uh, that's the emergency exit in the unlikely event you need it. Um, and uh, it's a real honour, tinged with sadness, to open this conference. So we're honouring 40 years of achievement in science and religion by Professor Alison McGrath. And Professor Alice McGarth is retiring from Oxford. This doesn't mean that he is um, breaking all links with the university. He has very generously offered to support our work uh, in the years ahead in various ways, for which we are very thankful. Uh, but it is, he will be finishing as the Andreas Idrius Chair uh, this summer. I want to say a few words about Alice McGrath and what it's been like to work with him. I've been working with him about 10 years. I'm, uh, my name is Andrew Pinson. I'm the research director of the Ian Ramsey Centre. Um, and well, having Alistair around has been like having the first stage of a Saturn V rocket booster <laughs> underneath uh, the whole field of science and religion, and I'd say also the Faculty of Theology here in Oxford. Maybe a modern example, one of, one of Elon Musk's heavy boosters if they're not blown up on the launch pad. Um, but really, it's like an oomph, a massive uh, power uh, that's really propelled us uh, into orbit. And um, the impact of our system can be seen in many ways. Science of Religion is offered as an undergraduate paper in the university. It's the most popular paper in the university at the moment in the whole field of theology, one of the most popular papers. Uh, the, we have a master's course, we have many doctoral students as well. It's really extraordinary. And the public talks that we give also have a massive impact, uh, not just in Oxford, but across the world. We had a talk here a few years ago, and I thought we were going to be overrun after thousands of people said they were coming on, on Facebook. So I <laughs> really got a little bit nervous about that. Um, but it really has been amazing what Alice has done both academically and in terms of outreach. And those two fields, academic, the academic field and the outreach, these are not, as has often been imagined in the past, at variance with one another. I think when Alistair started his career 40 years ago, he was warned not to be a popular writer because uh, that would detract from his um, uh, academic achievement. And he actually had to divide up his work initially into academic and popular writings. But that prejudice has, uh, has largely vanished over the last few decades, partly, in fact, because of Alastair's work. And it is no longer looked down upon to write with a popular audience in mind uh, and also with an academic audience in mind. Um, Alastair is able to do that partly because he's, he focuses a lot on clarity, now, when people first start to write academically, they write clearly because they don't know very much. Uh, and gradually, as they learn more, uh, their writing becomes more obscure. But for the very best people, uh, they start writing clearly again. And it only happens to a few. I can think of uh, a few professors at this university. Uh, my former supervisor, Eleanor Stump, Pope Benedict XVI. These are all people who write clearly. Um, uh, despite having a huge wealth of theology behind them. Alistair is one of these people. Uh, it's uh, both deep, his material is both deep, uh, and it's also clear. Um, and for someone who's delivered both the Holstein and Gifford lectures, uh, it's not easy to dismiss uh, someone like that uh, as not being uh, enough of a achiever academically. I want to say a few other things about what Alistair has done. He's... Um, he writes in a way, and he teaches in a way, that thinks along the line of the speakers, the line of the people he's talking about. So he encourages people not just to divide the world into the, the good guys and gals and the bad guys and gals, but tries to get into the minds of what it was like to be Athanasius or John Calvin or Thomas Aquinas, and why they would hold the views that they do. Um, and this helps to diffuse uh, a great many prejudices and is a win-win for everyone. Um, 
So uh, Alistair opens up the field of theology in a way that's non-partisan. What is also astonishing about Alistair is his trustworthiness in his writing. And I experienced this directly when I had to review uh, a book called Darwinism and the Divine, based on his Halcyon lectures in Cambridge in 2009. Now, I know quite a lot about science, philosophy, and theology. I was a particle physicist. I studied philosophy eight years. I got theology degrees. It's not difficult for me to find errors in books and science and religion. I went through this book. I couldn't find anything wrong with it at all. And I was astonished. I hoped, Alistair was not yet a professor here. I wrote to him. I said, this is an amazing achievement. I've never seen anything like it. Um, we can trust what he writes. He writes with a view to finding out the truth of things and getting things right. And that is, again, it ought to be a, a very highly regarded academic virtue, but it's not always uh, the case in practice. He's also managed to encourage diversity, and that can be seen in the people here today. I believe we have a large contingent from Latin America. Argentina, raise your hand. Uruguay, Brazil, uh, there's Chile, not Chile. Chile, yes, Colombia. Uh, now, that's the result of doing a big project in Latin America. Uh, it involves 250 scholars across 17 countries in the region. Uh, and more recently, we've undertaken an even bigger project across the 24 countries of Central Europe, uh, the Balkans, the Baltic, the Dnieper Basin, and Transcaucasia. And this has made the whole field more diverse. When I arrived at Oxford uh, in 2009, uh, right back at Oxford in 2009, science and religion was still a WASP subject. A WASP, I mean, was white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, and I'd actually have male. Um, but that's changed, and a lot of it's due to Alistair's work. We've expanded to Central Europe, we, uh, Eastern Europe, we've expanded in Latin America, and in doing so, uh, we encompass a great many Catholic countries, as well, as well as the birthplace of Protestantism, Slavonic Orthodoxy, the home of the ancient Georgian and Armenian churches, and three Muslim-majority countries, which have broadened immediately, immensely the religious and cultural range of participants in the field. Um, women in science and religion, that's also changed a lot in the last few years of Alistair's uh, work here at Oxford. We recently published a book, what was it? It's, uh, New Voices in Science and Religion. What was the word? Emerging. Emerging Voices in Science and Religion, all by female scholars many of whom are um, students of Alastair. Uh, and again, it's a massive cultural change in the whole field of, of science and religion. So Alastair has had an enormous impact. Uh, I'm very, very grateful to be working with him for so long. Uh, it's been a privilege. Uh, as I said, it's an honor and also a certain sadness uh, to be introducing this, this, this conference. And I want to say one more thing about Alistair's work, uh, about its scope, because uh, I want to compare two figures, John Bunyan and Dante. And both of them describe uh, the passage to eternal life in different ways. And John Bunyan wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, a classic of the English language. Uh, and right at the very end, the pilgrims reach the gates of the celestial city. Um, Dante goes right into the city and goes up with different levels of the hierarchy of heaven. Um, and the reason I introduce these two figures, uh, John Bunyan and Dante, is because Alistair McGrath's great work has largely been in the area of natural theology. That's a John Bunyan type uh, exercise. Um, but there's a whole lot more still to do. And like Dante, we can rise at the, into the uh, different levels of the celestial city. So I mention that fact, not, it's not a criticism of Alistair, but to encourage our young people here that the world, that there's still a huge amount left uh, to explore uh, and discover in science and religion in the years to come. Okay, so um, as many of you, uh, have, I bet I'm reading email contact with you already, you'll know that there's a brochure for the conference I'll be giving out these tomorrow morning. Uh, they just come back from the printers. Uh, we'll be starting tomorrow uh, at 9.30 with tea and coffee, first lecture.
uh, by um, Joanna McGrath will be at 10.30 a.m. But in the meantime, uh, I am very pleased to, to welcome Alison McGrath to give his plenary uh, presentation for this evening, Science of Religion, a, reflect, a Reflection on the State of the Art. Please welcome Alison McGrath. Well, thank you, Andrew, and it's great to be able to uh, speak on this theme. Uh, my last plenary lecture to the Atlanta Centre, and it's such a pleasure to be able to do this. And what I want to do is tonight to reflect on some aspects of science and religion, where it might be going, and a whole series of questions, really, which I think are appropriate in, uh, in a, at a point of transition. And I think uh, I ought to begin by thanking Dr. Andrew Pinson, who actually has put an enormous amount of effort into organizing this conference and securing very substantial funding for it. So I, I think we really need to begin by saying a very substantial uh, vote of thanks to you, Andrew, for all you've done. I also want to thank Professor Sarah Foote, who was then uh, chair of the Faculty Board of Theology, for appointing me, and also her successors, including Bill Wood, for putting up with me afterwards. <laughs> so, what are we talking about tonight? What actually is science and religion? And that does seem to me to be a very fair question to ask because it is, it is not a natural colligation. In other words, uh, this is very much uh, a bringing together of things that don't really belong together and yet seem to matter to people. Uh, it's not really a discipline. Maybe it's better thought of as a broad tradition of inquiry. But the key point is, I think, it's a really rich field in which people find that there are some connections that really make sense to them, that actually this really matters to them. But when you talk to them, you find very often they matter in different ways. And they see connections existing in different ways. And one of the reasons I'm so grateful to my two very distinguished predecessors, John Hedley Brook and Peter Harrison, is not just their support for me in this role, but also their excellent work to show how um, science and religion, both in terms of science and religion and the relationship between science and religion, actually has changed over time and actually varies quite substantially from one individual to another. So a complexification of the field I think is very, very helpful. And that certainly is something that I would want to echo. I think now as I begin to um, stand back a bit from these things, I would now use the phrase disciplinary imaginary as a way of trying to explain this idea. Uh, a way of imagining the relation of disciplines. And it's an idea I have shamelessly borrowed from somebody else, this is Elizabeth Goodstein, in her very able reflection on, on Georg Simmel, who was a, a sort of uh, almost like a, you know, one of these polymaths who nevertheless found he was able to, to establish a meaningful correlation of disciplines, not because they were related to each other, but because he could see way ways of bringing them together in his head. And that was good enough for him. And that phrase, I think, disciplinary imaginary, does work quite well. I hope it does, because um, I have a book coming out with the OUP in the autumn, which basically talks about natural philosophy as, in effect, retrieving a lost disciplinary imaginary. But I want to focus on this, because actually it is quite a useful idea. Um, there are many writers, like Cornelius Castoriadis, Charles Taylor, Catherine Lennon, um, and one of my DPhil students, uh, <laughs> Very good to have you here, uh, who is very interested in these things. And basically, it's a very helpful way of trying to, to visualize the relationship between subjects which for other people might not be related, but you can see there's a relationship and you bring them together in a personal synthesis which works for you. And on the basis of this personal synthesis, you can see how to do things with this. And certainly that is something that Edouard was found in his work, and I'm increasingly finding in my work that this is a very helpful way of looking at it. And imaginary, Lennon writes, is the shape or form in terms of which we experience the world and ourselves, a gestalt which carries significance, affect, and normative force. In other words, this works for me. Uh, it kind of holds things together, and I can move on and do things with this. I think that many of us find that science and religion actually is like that, even if we don't use that phrase. It's in effect saying these are areas of my life 
which in one sense are different, but they're important. And I want to find a way of bringing them together, letting them talk to each other, and hopefully enriching and informing me in doing so. And of course, all of this takes place against the background of disciplinary fragmentation. What I mean by that is that since, I think, really the 19th century, uh, we have seen what was originally a fairly unified field begin to fragment and then fragment further as subspecializations develop. And with subfragmentation, what you find is a new body of literature for that field, a new uh, burden of expertise. And the result is it becomes increasingly difficult to talk across disciplinary boundaries because you have to master different methodologies and different literatures. And that, I think, really is a problem. Because if we go back to the 17th century, when things seemed a lot easier, if you look at Kepler or Robert Boyle, um, for natural philosophy for them was just uh, a natural way of thinking, which brought together theology, philosophy, mathematics, even music and theology, all part of the same big picture of the world that they had. And nowadays, looking backwards, we would say, oh, look, it's interdisciplinary. But for them, it wasn't because there weren't any disciplines. They, in effect, just saw this as being the natural way of doing things. And I hope I'm not being too nostalgic in suggesting that maybe there is something to be said for going back to that. So basically, really what I want to emphasize is that a way of imagining the interconnectedness of things, it's not arbitrary, it works for us, and very often there are good reasons for these kind of associations that we develop. But the key thing is it's something that works for us. We feel we own this. We feel that this actually works. And that I think is a very important point because what I have found from many conversations, including lots of people who are here tonight, is that people who come to science of religion often do so because of personal agendas and interests. And that is not a bad thing. It's because you see something and you think, I've got to find a way of bringing these things together and having a serious discussion between them. That's why I thought it might be helpful to, in effect, um, tell my own story, which is how I came into this. Because as I tell this story, you'll say, well, look, it's best, no relation to my, my story at all. I'm, I'm different. And that's right. What I'm trying to make is people come to this from different places with different agendas, but they find this to be meaningful. So in my case, um, this is my uh, microscope, which is in my office. There it is. Um, uh, I can tell you now, there's, there's, there's a website for everything. And you will not believe this, but there is a website devoted to microscopes made by the firm of Carl Lights. And uh, you enter your, um, the number stamped on the microscope, and it will tell you when it was made. This was made in 1904. It was my great uncle, who was a medical student um, back then. It was his microscope. And when he became rather elderly, he gave it to me because he thought I might find it useful. And so this was my, the instrumental means into the study of the natural world, looking at pond water uh, near my home in Don Patrick in Northern Ireland. And the pond water I, I looked at was very active. There were an awful lot of um, little animals and stuff there, which I later discovered was due to the very high levels of pollution. But nevertheless, there were lots of things to look at and enjoy. And then, of course, I got into astronomy, building my own telescope. But the point is, I experienced that draw of nature. Here was something wonderful that seemed to intimate there was something beyond it. Um, and it basically um, led me on to come to Oxford and study the natural sciences. And I here must recognize two people who were extremely formative for me. Um, Jeremy Knowles, who was my tutor in organic chemistry and who kind of way got me going uh, in chemistry. And then my supervisor, who was Professor um, George Rada, who is still uh, very active. Um, and these two, in effect, consolidated my love for science. Uh, both Knowles and um, Rada had links with Merton and that ended up leading me to Merton. But the point I want to make is that as I began to study science as a teenager, I had a real problem, um, which was that um, I was loving science, but it seemed to me to lock me into a rather, a rather limited uh, vision of the world. Because in those days, 
Um, John Hedley Brooke had yet to make an impact. Um, in those days, science and religion were seen as enemies. They were implacably opposed to you. You could not be a good scientist and have religious interests. And I bought into this in quite a big way as a rather impressionable teenager. And therefore, in effect, uh, became quite aggressively atheist um, as a young man. And actually, you know, it has its benefits. When I, when I read Richard Dawkins these days, I feel all nostalgic because that's the way, uh, you know, I, I used to be <laughs> as well. But however, um, why is the council prevailed? As I began to study philosophy of science during my period between coming to Ox getting a scholarship here to Oxford and actually coming to Oxford, I began to realize things were a lot more complicated and so began to see the relationship between science and Christianity as being really exciting and interesting and wondered how on earth I could do this. And obviously the first thing I had to do was to um, learn how to um, do science properly. But a key theme here is holding things together. And that was certainly something that I experienced. I mentioned Merton. I won a scholarship to Merton um, as a result of the work I did with George Rader and discovered that this senior scholarship at Merton actually, although it was now used mainly for DPhil students, could also be used for doing a first degree. And so I took my, um, my life in my hands and went to um, senior tutor and asked if I could do both. In other words, um, do my DPhil during the day in at the labs and my BA in theology during the evenings. Um, and for some reason, Merton said yes. I think they, they just thought it would be fun to see what actually happened. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, the result was um, I managed to do my DPhil and uh, BA in theology at the same time. So in 1978, uh, I got both of these things. I have to say, really forced me to make those connections. And that, I think, is the key theme, which is so important for science and religion, and that is holding things together. Because what I'm really trying to say to you is we have to find a way of doing this. And Ian McGilchrist's book is one that many of you have read. Dr. Pinson uh, frequently talks about it, and, and rightly so, because it's a very significant book. Here is my favorite line from that book. Our talent for division, for seeing the parts, is of staggering importance, second only to our capacity to transcend it in order to see the whole. You know, zooming in, zooming out. And for me, that is so important that, in effect, yes, you want to master the detail. Yes, you want to try and find out how this works, how that works, but you're always asking, is there a bigger picture? Is there some way of seeing the one behind the many, so to speak? And that does seem to me to be really important, holding everything together. Now, obviously, um, uh, Ian McGilchrist um, is a later writer, and I began to get into these questions earlier. And I want to tell you about my encounter with Mary Midgley. Now, Mary Midgley and I first met in 2008. I've been asked to go up to Newcastle to give um, some memorial lectures. And uh, as you will probably know, Mary Midgley um, worked in the Department of Philosophy there and had retired there. And she had read some stuff I'd written about Richard Dawkins. And as you may know, she was a very severe critic of Richard Dawkins. So she suggested we meet for a cup of tea. So after I gave these lectures, we went off to find a room somewhere, and um, Mary Midgley, I think, was treated as a kind of local hero by people, and it was astonishing to see her, um, in fact, being waited on hand and foot by all these university flunkies. And we sat there, and, and Mary Midgley, I don't know if, if, if you um, ha, see her, she's quite an austere person, there she is. Um, she had a, a cup of tea precariously perched on her knee while she waggled her finger at me, telling me why she felt Richard Dawkins' reductionism was nonsense and why, why genes could not be selfish or jealous or anything like that. And I, I tried to defend Dawkins' points, but I learned very quickly this was not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, we got on to much more positive things, and um, Mitchell began to explain to me how she held things together. For her, reductionism was bad. What you had to do was respect complexity while at the same time finding ways of beginning to see how complexity could be accommodated in a framework that allowed you both to appreciate it but also to see the underlying unity was there. And so I come away from Mary Midgley with um, 
many thoughts, and as you'll probably know, uh, I quote her a lot in my recent writings because she's a very lucid writer. She's a public philosopher, which means she writes in a very accessible and engaging way. And this is one of the quotes I endlessly uh, use because it is so good. No one pattern of thought, not even in physics, is so fundamental that all others will eventually be reduced to it. Instead, for most important questions in human life, a number of different conceptual toolboxes always have to be used together. Now, I think that is, that is pure gold. That is really someone saying, look, if it's complicated, you have to use different research methods. And you then have to find a way of weaving together the insights that these different research methods give, rather than suppressing them or paying selective attention so that only some of them find their way into your thinking. So that, I think, is very good. And then this is from her final work, What is Philosophy For? Um, she writes, on the one hand, I want to emphasize there really is only one world, but also on the other, that this world is so complex, so various, I think she means variegated, that we need dozens of distinct thought patterns to understand it. We can't reduce all these ways of thinking to any single model. Instead, we have to use all our philosophical tools to bring these distinct kinds of thought together. Now, I think that's right, and that's the way I think myself. In effect, you welcome complexity. You welcome, as a scientist or whatever, the need for multiple research methods. But you're then left with the problem, how do I bring all of these things together so that, in effect, I have a unified uh, way of seeing things rather than simply a plurality of insights, which are or, you know, laid out like that, but not connected. How do you connect a plurality of insights? That's what she's getting at, and that, I think, is really important. So I come back to this book, because this is really me reflecting on this whole business of how we try to hold a complex set of questions together. I wrote this work in my sabbatical year, and the question I was really dealing with was this. I look at the history of natural philosophy and note the motivation that lies behind it, which is basically to try and find the bigger picture which lies behind our observations and our experience of the natural world. And as time progresses, the story becomes more complicated. As in effect, there's disciplinary fragmentation, there's a ride of methodological pluralism, and there's a growing realization there's a need to try and hold things together because they are fragmenting. And if you look at the writings of um, various early modern scholars, um, one of the things you will notice, for example, Anne Blair has written very, very well, this Anne Blair at Harvard, um, you have, in effect, what is information overload, even by the late Renaissance, and certainly by the early modern period, which is simply the realization that no single individual is able to master all of these fields and hold them together. And that, of course, is a very important point to make. So what I try to do in this book is to say we need to find some way of holding together the insights of various things. Because if you were a natural philosopher back in the 17th century, then one of the key themes is not simply wanting to learn about nature. It was this idea of learning from nature. That very famous um, motif you find particularly uh, in um, some early 17th century writers, uh, Robert Boyle is a very good example, a priest in the temple of nature. You're not just trying to understand it, you're respecting it. You're saying there's something here that has integrity that needs to be preserved and we need to try and ask what is there we can learn from this, not simply learn about this. And I think it is something that we do need to reflect on because with increasingly instrumentalized uh, approaches to nature, we very often see it as something we're trying to master, to reduce to our own categories, rather let it challenge us and perhaps ask whether we need to be thinking in different ways. So for me, um, natural philosophy is one way of holding things together. And uh, as, as someone who's Irish, I suppose it's inevitable I'd end up reading uh, John Banville. He's a very good writer. 
And he's also interested in the history and philosophy of science, and he has written extensively on Newton, on Kepler, and Copernicus. What he does in this novel, Kepler, is in effect to reconstruct in narrative form Kepler's, Kepler's vision of the unity of reality. And this is how Banville expresses what Kepler saw. I'm going to read it to you slowly. And it's very well written. And the key point is, we used to think all these things were disconnected. Now we see they're all a map of a single whole. Kepler's Harmonia Mundi, that's, that's um, 1619, very important work, The Harmonies of the World, was for him a new kind of labor before he had voyaged into the unknown, and the books he brought back were fragmentary and enigmatic charts, apparently disconnected with each other. Now, he understood that they were not maps of the islands of an Indies, but of different stretches of the shore of one great world. The Harmonia was their synthesis. Now, Banville you know, has mastered English and puts it very, very well, but you can see the point I'm trying to get at holding things together, not little dots here and there, but rather parts of the same structure. Each part discloses something distinct about that structure, but it is the same structure. And that seems to me to be a helpful way of trying to hold together science of religion as a coherent field, whatever you want to call it. Because in effect, it's saying we're in a world in which there are many aspects to it, We've got to find a way of re respecting them and finding a way of achieving some kind of synthesis, even if it's a personal synthesis that works for me and not necessarily for somebody else. But of course, there are those who would now say, well, this is all very well, but we leave this behind. And Stephen Weinberg is a very good example of this, and this is his book, To Explain the World, The Discovery of Modern Science. The phrase to explain the world is interesting. If you look at um, uh, Diltai or other German philosophers in the 19th century, you know, they will draw a very sharp distinction between explaining, which is rationalist, which is in effect simply figuring out how things function, and understanding, which is seeing how things are interconnected. And in many ways, Weinberg here, in choosing to emphasis explain, has kind of way taken a very rational, cerebral, disinterested approach to the natural world. This is not one you would have found in earlier writings, who would in effect see the engagement of nature as personally transformative, as something, as I was saying earlier, you learn from. And I don't see that in Weinberg, because for Weinberg, science is really about a quest for order within nature. And it has nothing, and this is what he himself says, to say to those who want to think about goodness, justice, or love. For Weinberg, we just have to leave those behind. Science has had to outgrow such pursuits and beliefs. If you think that, then you can see why science and religion shines out as a way of bringing together explanation and understanding. In effect, bringing together what ought not really ever to have been separate except for, for the reasons of clarity of presentation. You know, these are things that really belong together. These things matter to us as human beings. And that's why I think science and religion resonates with this deep human intuition that there is something worthwhile there to be found and held together. So that does seem to me to be very important. Now, in my own um, attempts to be Idrius Chair here, what I've tried to do, I think, is, and I think uh, Dr. Vincent's hinted at this, is to try and develop capacity in this field, mainly by supervising lots of DPhil students who will be the next generation who, in effect, carry this whole um, process forward. I think that is very, very important. Uh, uh, when I was at Merton, I, I, I had a colleague there who was also a, a senior scholar. He went on to, um, like me, get an endowed chair this time at Cambridge. And he retired recently, and there was a note in, uh, in a tribute to him which mentioned that during his academic career, he had one doctoral student. 
one doctoral student. Now, I mean, okay, supervising a doctoral student does take a lot of time. I think part of me said, how did he get away with that? <laughs> uh, but I think the deeper part of me felt, um, isn't that sad? Because doctoral students help you grow. They help you realize what you don't know. They help you to find answers. They help you to share answers. They help you to mentor and encourage the people who are going to lead the field in the years to come. So that to me, if I have any legacy, it might well be my doctoral students because they really do matter. I want to emphasize that point. But that is important. And I think uh, I also want to say I've tried in my time uh, here in Oxford to, to avoid having science and religion as a kind of little niche area tucked away uh, on the fringes of the Faculty of Theology and Religion. I've tried very hard to in effect make sure that I engage questions that do connect with faculty interests. For example, I shall mention some articles I recently simply to give you an idea of where this subject takes you. This is from a few years ago. This is in effect looking at alchemy, which is a very interesting uh, aspect of the relation of science of religion in the late Renaissance, perhaps late Middle Ages, and noticing how in effect this informs um, the poetry of George Herbert at one particular point. And once you, once you get the background, you can make sense of what is going on. And I published it not in a theological journal, not in a science or religion journal, but actually in, in the George Herbert journal, an English journal. Um, and it was really trying to build a link there and say, hey, science or religion helps other disciplines. I think that is a very important point. Or well, this one, this will not surprise you, this is in effect. Um, this will worry you, actually. This is the very first article talking about the theological significance of Mary Midgley. Um, now, I'm sad about that because this is an article somebody ought to have written 10, 15 years ago. But anyway, it's written now, and the key point is to show how her approach instantly connects up with theological debates about, for example, the nature of salvation, or again, the doctrine of God, in which you're dealing with a complex reality that needs to be captured and represented adequately and fully not simply partially. And that does seem to me to be a very significant theme in theology where there's always this risk of reduction. Uh, Gustav Hippo you know, makes that very famous point, um, which is that there are, our perennial tendency is to reduce reality to what we can manage intellectually rather than expand our intellects to be able to cope with the way things really are. And that does seem to me to be a really important point. A third article is um, really looking at a former Archbishop of York, John Habgood. John Habgood, um, while he was Archbishop of York, um, was very helpful um, here at Oxford during the 1990s. We, um, Ralph Waller, who was then Principal Harris Manchester College, established the Andreas Idrius Lectures in Science of Religion to see if there was any interest in this topic. John Habgood came and talked and got a very large audience and a very positive response. He's one of the, he was a Cambridge research scientist who went on to the Archbishop of York, and his views on science and religion are actually very well thought through. So again, I thought that is something that needs to be looked at. And I published in the Journal of Anglican Studies to make sure it got noticed in that denominational niche. So again, that does seem to be important. Another one uh, is, in effect, revisiting Stephen Jay Gould. This is in Zygon, which, in my view, is the best journal of science and religion. I say that nothing because Arthur's here, but because actually that, that's just the way things are. It's a great journal, and it, it promises to go even further under his very talented leadership. But this is saying maybe, maybe we have prematurely foreclosed a discussion about what Stephen Jay Gould says in science and religion. Because in all the textbooks, um, the tendency is to say, Stephen Jay Gould is non-overlapping magisteria. Science, religion, don't talk, they can't talk. Uh, and of course, that's not good. And we all know it's not good, but actually, Gould himself discovered it's not good. Because in 1998, E.O. Wilson published his book, Consilience, The Unity of Human Knowledge, in which he took an aggressively scientific view to the way in which human knowledge works. And Gould did not like it and felt there was a need to say, look, there's a science, there's a humanities, they are different, but they need to talk to each other, and there are ways in which they can mutually illuminate each other. So if you'd like to see a significant revision 
of his position in the last year of his life, because sadly he didn't live long after that, as many of you will know. So that seemed to be important. And finally, much more theological, this is actually in a standard journal of systematic theology, it's called Journal of Theology. And um, if you, those of you who are theologians will spot what I'm doing here. It is, in effect, immediately saying this is a response to Thomas F. Torrance's very famous lecture and article, Space, Time, and Incarnation. And the point I'm making is that Torrance seems to think of the incarnation as, how can God get into X, Y, Z, T? I'm saying, look, it's not just physical, spatial location. It's about entering into a place which has associations, which has significance, into history, which is the place in which we live and have subjective experiences, and trying to unpack the difference that that way of thinking, that much more um, subjectively engaged way of thinking, brings to this. So there are some of the things I've been doing to give you an idea of why I'm trying to make connections. But this, I think, uh, which is what Dr. Vincent hinted at earlier, is important, because again, I, I don't really do much in the way of advocation, but on this matter, I, in effect, um, have decided that it's important to really say something, and that is that there are not enough women in the field of science and religion. And again, if you think of the greats, like Nancy Murphy, I mean, she's there, but she's quite a lonely figure. She's on her own. And I think it's very significant that there is this gap. And there are reasons we might give, and that's understandable. What we need to do is try and change this. And for me, the best way of changing this is by encouraging young women to become involved in this field, and in effect, once they're in it, they're going to transform it. Now here at Oxford we've been very fortunate. We've had a lot of very able female students, and some of them are contributors to this volume, which is basically showcasing the research of young women in the 20s, perhaps early 30s, and saying, look, this is the kind of thing that's going on. You need to know about this. You need to be aware of this. And that, I think, is important because um, we do find women being discouraged a bit because they feel there aren't other women in the field. We want to say there are and name who they are so, in effect, they can be uh, encouraging them to take this forward. I mentioned Nancy Murphy. Nancy Murphy very kindly agreed to write a, a wonderfully witty final chapter in which she describes her own career and all the obstacles and opportunities she provided or she was faced with as a woman in the field. I do hope that this book will be forgotten because if the problem ceases to exist, this book will be forgotten. If it doesn't change, then we'll keep going back to this because it really does need to be said. We need to encourage women in the field and women to become part of the field because there's so much more that could be done. So that's something I think that is quite important. One of the things I've done quite a lot of work on, again, Dr. Vincent hints at this, is, is the relation of natural theology. And this has been something I think is very important for me personally. Um, but I have to say, I, I'm not sure the game is worth the effort. I think that there are real issues about um, how natural theology is defined in this article, which I think sums up some of my concerns. Natural theology, a, a manifesto for a new definition and an expansion of its significance. I simply say, look, we, we do need to try and get away from this idea that somehow natural theology is a sort of pre-modern way of trying to prove God's existence from nature and try and recover a richer vision. I'm not sure this works, but I do think there's a need for us to find some kind of bridge or, if you like, a liminal zone between science and religion, how we understand these, and however we understand the trajectory of intellectual travel. Are we moving from nature and hence discovering God, or do we begin from God and hence see nature in a new way and hence respect it more? How do we do this? I would say this is an important area of uh, work, um, and uh, I have spent a lot of time working on this, but I think my own feeling is that the category of natural philosophy may give us the framework that allows us to do this. Because if you look at exemplars like uh, Newton or Galileo or um, 
uh, or Kepler, you know, a, uh, an Anglican, a Catholic, and a Lutheran natural philosopher, then all of these just do this and see this as being quite natural. They, they, they in effect, incorporate a, a form of natural theology into their thinking, but it's not this proves God kind of stuff. It's much more this is all part of a bigger coherent picture which works perfectly well. Now, I'm going to wrap up in a moment. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about Max Planck. I think he's interesting. Um, here, the, the picture here, the, the central figure is Max Planck, Einstein on one hand, and on the other side is uh, Millikan, the guy who um, uh, actually gave uh, substance to Einstein's rather heuristic idea of a photon. I want to focus in on Max Planck in bringing this lecture to an end. Um, he's someone who I um, really got to know in my first year here at studying chemistry when there was a, a theoretical course which I took as my specialist subject on quantum theory and Planck and I have to say Einstein featured very, very prominently in that. And it was very good to read him and get to know him. But I also have to say that Planck actually offers us something which is rather significant and that is, if we look at this lecture here, uh, this is a short book published, uh, there the, the are two lectures here. The second of them is Religion and Natural Science, a lecture given in 1937. The reason why I think Max Planck needs further investigation is that when you read this, you begin to realize this is coming from a very, very different place than the kind of 1960s stuff we find in North America, which actually has done a lot to shape contemporary thinking about science and religion. And as I look, thinking through how, how science and religion are going to develop as a field, I think very often what you find is that it begins here and then it moves on, and then moving on, sometimes it leaves things behind, sometimes it picks up new things. And I personally feel that um, we have perhaps been led to believe that um, the, the, the field of science and religion was self-evidently something like this. But this is simply how certain prominent individuals of the 1960s, 1970s thought it looked from their perspective. But actually, we might need to move on and go further, go wider. And that certainly is my view. But Max Planck just seemed to me to offer a very helpful way of thinking about science and religion, which actually hasn't found its way into contemporary discussion. And therefore, I think it should. But I'm mentioning Max Planck for another reason. And that is, he writes quite extensively on how scientific progress works. And this is, um, this, is, this is the formal way in which he states this. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die, and a new generation grows up that is, with, from, that is familiar with it. And the point I'm trying to make here is that significant figures can simultaneously catalyze and inhibit discussion in a field. This is very often summarized in a more familiar version of this statement, which is this, science advances one funeral at a time. So how do I feel about retirement? <laughs> well, um, what I want to say uh, with complete sincerity is I've greatly enjoyed being the Idris chair here. I'm very, very grateful to have the opportunity. But it is time to move on. It's time because I actually want to do some other things, write other things, and that's, that's good. I have greatly enjoyed doing what I've done. But as time has come to say, well, you know, I'm getting old and tired. We need fresh blood. Um, and two things are very important. We need new energy on the part of the Idris chair. I'm getting tired. But more importantly, if you are associated with certain positions, uh, it's always good to stand back and stand aside so that others come in who may not agree with you, but will nevertheless develop a field. My final thought is very simply this. Although I'm stepping back, I'm stepping back in the knowledge there are an awful lot of very talented people who are coming up to fill positions like this. And that, I have to say, makes me, as someone who's about to retire, feel very happy and fulfilled. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.
absolutely awesome presentation. We couldn't possibly have asked for something better. And um, very, very grateful for how you shaped that, summarizing it and giving us uh, a way forward as well. We have um, uh, up to 25 minutes left for questions. Um, and my uh, friend and colleague, Ignacio Silva, is going to bring around a microphone. Uh, so this microphone will not amplify your voice. Uh, do speak loudly. But it will enable your voice to be captured by video. Um, and we like to put our uh, lectures on YouTube afterwards. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, yes. Anyone have any questions? Um, a really in Sorry, is, is it on? It, it's on, isn't it? A really, really good, um, interesting presentation, and and some very. I think you've got some very important themes. My question is around um, uh, having worked in a multidisciplinary kind of setting myself for some time now. I'm very aware of the tyranny of disciplinary boundaries that it, it stops us seeing the whole. Um, I, I think some of that comes from the early modern era uh, and the uh, the kind of the, dis the sort of boundaries between disciplines in, for example, the dissenting academies, which may not be just about semantics and epistemology, but probably more political and social factors. Would you care to comment on that? Well, I think um, you're right, and I think this is this is in many ways part of the problem that in effect disciplinary boundaries are not simply in effect about this area of territory. It's all about competition for funding, it's about status, it's a whole series of things. And actually this doesn't really help the kind of dialogue that ought to take, across, take place across disciplinary boundaries. I think one of the things I have found important is the building of personal relationships across disciplinary boundaries. Where in effect um, you are trusted as a person and that tr there's a transfer of trust from the person to the thinking and disciplinary commitment. So I think I do want to emphasize how important um, seemingly insignificant things like meals or um, you know, having a drinks party are because it allows those relationships to be gone. And that once, once you've established a friendship, then you're much more likely to be receptive to what somebody else is going to say. And I think that, that that is important. A second thing I have noticed is that um, people tend to relax and be much more willing to talk about things if there's nobody else in their own discipline present. Uh, not because they're worried about contradiction, but because they, they feel that they are not being judged or uh, criticized by others. They can actually try and make a meaningful contribution to what is a, quite often a very complex discussion. And so I think that that's one of the reasons we might think that events like this are actually quite important, because it does allow these conversations to get underway. But I think you're right. Actually, we, we cannot undo the emergence of disciplines and the fragmentation of disciplines. And indeed, we, we don't want to, because um, one of the reasons that um, you know, medicine works so well is it has fragmented in disciplines because we needed those specific disciplines to get certain jobs done. And therefore, they are task-orientated, so you can see why they actually are so important. I think the, the difficulty is the conversations across boundaries, which, if, if you like, follow a different set of rules. And I think that's why um, Oxford and Cambridge, in particular, actually are quite good for this. Because if you think about it, each Oxbridge College actually is an interdisciplinary gathering where people get to know each other and have the kind of conversations that might take you somewhere very interesting. But it's actually quite difficult to do that somewhere else. So I think it's a very good question you're asking. I can't solve it, I'm afraid. Um, I will say that in trying to make the transfer from theology to, from natural science to theology, it was very, very difficult. And my, my friends who were natural scientists felt I had a, a momentary aberration of, you know, not, not, not entirely right in my mind. And those who I was joining as theologians were deeply suspicious because I was bringing a rigorous empirical methodology to theology. And uh, indeed, to this day, I'm still not quite sure how, scientific, how theological method works, but I could see that there's something there that, that needs further exploration. So there is, I think, always going to be this, um, this, this slight tension. I think it just comes with the territory and we have to learn to work with it. And I think it means that um, if you're involved in this, you need to be aware that this is the kind of thing that's going on. Anything you can do to reduce 
that kind of tension would really be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, McGrath, uh, for this eye-opening uh, lecture. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, Chinese theology, and I know that you were invited to China before, and um, especially doing theology in, uh, uh, for the Chinese context. Um, as you know, uh, theology in China is pretty uh, oppressed. Uh, so uh, from your perspective, uh, how would you, uh, uh, can you comment on how to do Chinese theology uh, of science, with science, uh, by taking it to the public square and then uh, uh, maybe engage with the Chinese philosophies and, and, and religions in the current political uh, atmosphere, and uh, especially in the uh, uh, Chinese science community, uh, try to um, advance in their uh, scientific pursuit um, uh, uh, to help the country uh, really uh, gain more strength in science and uh, technology. Uh, I would really appreciate if you can give some Thank comments. You. Yes, it, this is a difficult question and I appreciate you asking it. I mean, one of the difficulties is that um, I am not Chinese and therefore the danger is I'll come across as a Western colonialist who is um, imposing alien ideas on um, another group of people. And that, that is, a, I think, that's perhaps overstated, but there's a real concern there. I think um, I, when I first began to go to Hong Kong uh, back in the 19, it was late 1980s, um, I began to realize there was quite a significant gap between Western ways of doing theology and what I was encountering in um, churches in Hong Kong and colleges in Hong Kong. And that did force me to think, look, these are ways that I'm presenting which are actually culturally grounded. And I have learned the extent to which culture impacts on theology. How, therefore, can I begin to think how one might um, remove these cultural elements so that, in fact, other cultural elements could be brought in to correlate with these. And that, that's something I've never entirely solved, I have to say. But I do think there are several things I can say that might be helpful. One of them is that um, one, of the, one of the anxieties about um, theology in China is it's seen as being Western. And that, that's a fair point. But actually we need, I think, to recollect that theology originated in places like um, Alexandria or Roman North Africa in the 3rd, 4th and 5th centuries when the West just didn't exist. And therefore one way of beginning to meet this is in effect by going back to people like Athanasius or Augustine of Hippo and presenting them as role models from which Chinese theologians can draw without being Western. These are not Western figures. Um, I think that is a very important point. You could easily present Augustine, for example, as someone who lived under Roman imperial rule and knew, knew about it, but wasn't, wasn't entirely persuaded of its merits, if I can put it like that. So I think that, that is one way in which we can begin to do this. Another, I think, is to look at the history of the interaction of science and religion in China in the 20th century. And the, the episodes I'm thinking of are to do with... Um, uh, the early 20th century, um, the, the, um, the rise of Chinese nationalism, um, and the feeling that the, the only way in which China was going to establish itself as an independent national cultural entity was by buying into Western notions of science, because this, in effect, was about progress. And then there was a reaction against that, and the movement that we now call Neo-Confucianism really made the point that, that, that to be Chinese is to have a set of values, a set of principles of living, and science does not give you that, and therefore you need to find one way of supplementing science with something else. Now, I feel that insight might be helpful, that in effect you, you are saying, look, science is, is very, very helpful. Technology can be very, very helpful to us in many ways, although it does have its dangers, but it doesn't answer questions like, how do I live well? And what is the meaning of life? How can I look after my family and, and my, my community better? And we need something more than science. And actually, my own feeling, I must emphasize this is simply my private opinion, which may be completely misguided, 
is to say that actually we, we can begin to say maybe theology's fruits, in other words, the, the, the understanding it gives us about and the basis of morality or the nature of meaning or how we live the good life, actually might say we need to address these ways because science doesn't. And actually Christianity does something interesting to say and theology tries to articulate that and therefore you need to accept this, but nevertheless, this is definitely worth looking at and exploring as a possible way ahead. So I think the other thing I want to say is that the best people to have this conversation in public are Chinese people. I, I'm very happy, I'm sure there are others as well, who are very happy to have private conversations. But I think that really the level at which these conversations are taking place, it's best that people like me kind of take a back seat because we will be seen as maybe part of the problem. And therefore, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's a really diplomatic issue about how best to do this. But that, that's a very short answer to what I think is a very good question. And certainly, when I was last in Beijing giving lectures on theology, again, I, I did feel the, the sense that um, there are a lot of, very, of ideas which seem very self-evident to Western theology, which actually are very difficult to translate into Chinese. And the reason they're difficult to translate into Chinese is because they don't resonate naturally with Chinese culture. So I think there's a lot to be learned from that. And I think that we are looking to you and your colleagues to, to help in this very important way. Obviously, we'd like to help, but the danger is sometimes by wanting to help, you actually become part of the problem. Thank you. I think we had a question along here. Adina, yes, just there. Thank you, Professor McGrath. My question is, you mentioned that natural theology and natural philosophy might be analogous to an alchemical link that facilitates the holding together of science and religion. How might these views relate to hermetic philosophy? I think that's a very good question. Um, if we go back to alchemy, I mean, nowadays we, we would see alchemy as um, some kind of superstition, in effect, irrational perhaps. But actually, the more you look at it, its history, you begin to realize that actually it was scientific by the categories of the time. Nowadays, we would say, well, look, you cannot talk about the transmutation of metals because we now know, you know, um, thank you very much, Mr. Dalton, that, um, that you, you just can't do this because atoms are fixed in terms of their, their structures. And that's a wonderful insight, but it's quite a late insight. And in the late Renaissance, people felt that the, the identity, for example, of metal was malleable, that actually by, by going through certain processes, you could change it. And that that's where this idea of transmutation begins to come from. What I think I would say is that um, one of the reasons why alchemy did become so important was this feeling that um, it's not simply a physical process which has, is potentially beneficial. It has a spiritual or philosophical dimension, which is in effect about the transmutation of this way of thinking or this way of living into something that is better and more noble. So if you take um, what's called chrysopoeia, the, the, the changing of base metal into gold, then that in effect is taking something that's of little value, making it valuable, and you can see immediately how that linked up with the broader human quest to take something like our lives, which may not be very much, but do something better with them or take our ways of thinking and make them better. Or you can link it, of course, with the Christian idea of salvation, which is about the transformation of human existence. So actually, it was very, very natural for a poet like George Herbert, who was deeply um, rooted in Christian theology, to see links between um, theology and alchemy, which he would help him express his ideas um, in, in his poems. How does it relate to the hermetic tradition? Um, my feeling is that um, we do tend to be somewhat critical of this, but I think uh, it's always helpful to contextualize this in its own time and ask what were these people trying to do? Now we might raise questions about um, how we would do that today, but my own feeling is that very often we can learn something from the ways in which early people try to do this, not necessarily because they're right, but because they are very often asking the right questions or, or putting their fingers on something that needs to be engaged. And that for me is, I think, quite important. The sense that, that we need all the help we can get to make sense of our world and our lives and hold together 
its different aspects in some kind of meaningful whole? That's, that's a very short answer to a very good question. Thank you. Professor McGrath, thank you for a wonderful lecture, and thank you, by the way, for all your work in this field that, uh, I mean, it has been so helpful for so many people. My question is related to uh, uh, what do you think uh, can be the contribution of science and religion as, as a, a discipline or as a disciplinary imaginary, like you beautifully put, to society's actual uh, present problems, like practical problems, for example, uh, all things ranging from from uh, far right politics and, and and these social issues that have been just plaguing the world uh, recently. Do you think uh, science and religion, as a dis discipline or as a disciplinary imaginary, could have something to to say about these things or to help uh, today's societies in that sense? Well, I think the answer is yes. Um, the issue is trying to identify some good examples that would perhaps enable a wider conversation. I think the rise of COVID is, is a very good example. I mean, we, I mean, certainly here in Britain, you know, the response to COVID is being presented as a kind of scientific triumph. And, and in many ways, it has been. It's been, it's been remarkable how uh, Oxford in particular was able to rise to this challenge and do so much. But um, the, the real difficulty is that we're now faced with a legacy of this, which science isn't able to solve. You know? uh, and we, we need to find out some way of trying to, to deal with this. I read a very interesting article in an Australian journal um, two days ago, which uh, it was, uh, it was about a, um, a surgeon um, describing how he'd been able to um, heal somebody's hand. This was a young man who um, had tried to slash his wrists because he, he was miserable. And the surgeon was able to put his wrists back together and use his hands. And um, the young man, I suppose, I suppose he expected the young man to say, thank you very much. He said, well, look, you've, you've fixed my hand, but you haven't fixed my life. You know, that, that, that's what the problem is. And, and you know, okay, it's a, a very um, uh, interesting example, but you can see the point. Actually, technology is very good at fixing certain things, but there are deep problems in human nature. And the real difficulty is that unless human nature changes, then technological advance means we're able to do rather more with what in the past was not quite so possible and do some very, very worrying things indeed. I mean, for example, we might think of a situation in Ukraine um, where you just realize that we are totally dependent on what one man decides to do, and that might be completely irrational. So, you know, there's a real concern about this. So what I think I would want to say is that it is no critique of science at all to say that um, the problem of human nature remains. That actually, uh, we very often aren't able to cope with complex issues. We very often take decisions which are um, haphazard, which are not well thought through. And very often we'll choose an option in which, without realizing we are biased, and we choose something that benefits us and not other people. I think one of the things that science or religion might be able to talk about is how we live in a complex world where very often there are big decisions that have to be made which straddle disciplinary boundaries. We need to make sure we have people in there who understand the science but also understand something about the well-being of human nature and things like that. And that does seem to me to be something we, we could think about. I think that um, the real difficulty is we will say, well, science and religion, well, it's a terribly abstract idea. But what I think you need to say is, look, what we are trying to do is bring together two very significant cultural and intellectual presences in the world together to see if they can try and help sort each other out. And indeed, that is what Andreas Idrios, who was um, a senior figure in the World Health Organization in Geneva, wanted to do. Because one of the things he noticed, uh, as someone who worked for the WHO and administered his programs, was that actually very often religion kind of way brought stability and meaning situations which the, otherwise there wouldn't be any at all. So I think that, that is one way in which you could begin to establish that. But there's an awful lot more needs to be said. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Please behind you. <coughs> Thank you very much for the lecture. And I'm sure I don't speak only for myself. I'm sure other 
um, your other students would also um, want to thank you for your support and continued um, encouragement. My question is on affect. You mentioned affect a few times. And I was wondering if there is a difference between um, an aff affect state like wonder or awe that one might feel in the face of um, a scientific um, scientific work such as um, the um, Webb's, NASA's Webb telescopes photograph of, of deep space versus the affect state we might feel at how um, at seeing that phenomenon has been created by God. But not, um, is there a difference between those two affect states? And if there is, what, what is the difference? I think this is a very good question. Um, and um, I'll begin to answer it, though it needs a long answer. I think that um, Aristotle long ago said that actually wonder in the presence of nature is what stimulates what we would now call science. Uh, and, and the point he was trying to make is that, that you, you see something which is astonishing or wonderful and you want to know more about it. It draws you in. So you feel like wonder is the effective motivation for wanting to find out more about this. And I think that remains the case today. I mean, I showed you my little microscope. Uh, and likewise, I'm looking at a little telescope. I made it myself. It was, it was really not very good, but it was good enough to let me see how rich the star fields of the Milky Way were. And that, I was over, overwhelmed by that. It was a, an effective response. And the effective response, in effect, made me want to know more about this. I felt that um, uh, one of the things about um, the sense of wonder or beauty is it's not just something you experience, something you want to possess or something you want to take hold of. And I felt I wanted to know more about this. So in fact, that's why I became a scientist. And there are many scientists here tonight who probably tell very, very similar stories. What I think theology can do, you mentioned doctrine of creation, and that will serve us very, very well in this respect, is to create expectation and receptivity. In other words, you expect this to be good, and so you start looking for the things that are going to be good. In other words, you are a much more attentive observer. You are really primed, if you like, to see things that are going to excite you uh, and so on. And so for me as a theologian now, I would kind of say that there's a counterpart between the informed reflection on nature and, and worship. They're actually, they're different, but actually similar things are happening. You're being confronted with something that is amazing and wondering and creates this response. And the response actually is kind of linked up with God, perhaps by different routes, but nevertheless the connections are still there. So for me, I think that this is one of the reasons why um, the whole subjective experience of wonder or, or amazement is so important because it's saying, in effect, it's not that I, I choose to do this. It's, it's sort of I'm drawn into this. See what I'm saying? It's almost as if there's something about this that makes me feel compelled to become involved, to know more. And I, I've known that experience myself. It, it is very, very significant. So I think that, that's one of the things that I would want to say. It also, I think, means that um, I quoted from... Um, remember Stephen Weinberg's book on explaining the world. Um, explanation doesn't really help create a sense of wonder. You need something more than that. I mean, you can explain why wonder happens, but, but that does not in any sense diminish the sense of, of significance that, um, that people have when they have the sense of wonder. I can remember um, when I was a student, when, when you're a student, you do all kinds of weird things, but uh, I and a friend decided we, we, we'd go round Iran and we went because it's very, very hot there, we went at night by bus. And one evening the bus broke down, we had to get out, it was pitch black in the middle of the desert, and the stars blazed from the sky. I mean, they never seen anything like it. And it created a sense of overwhelming wonder. You know, I've never seen anything like this. Here in England we have light pollution, but there was nothing there, it was just astonishing. I could never recapture that experience, but it, it changed me, it kind of made me um, much more receptive to the importance of the aesthetic, the affective aspect of the natural world, and realizing that science is very, very good at this part of the spectrum of engagement in nature, but there's an awful lot that lies beyond it. And finding, we want to bring all of these together in a sort of holistic response to the natural world. I think science and religion helps to do that, but I, I need another lecture really to say how to do it properly. But thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you very much for all those wonderful questions. Thank you to you, Alastair. I must just do a couple of practicalities. The first of all, I've got to ask you, if you're staying, if you're staying at Jury's Inn, but don't know how to get there, would you please raise your hand? If you're staying at Jury's Inn. Right, now, if you're staying at Jury's Inn and you do know how to get there, would you please raise your hand? So, sir, please look at these people. Find one of them, or several of them, and ask them to help you get there. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Jury's Inn is about two miles away, uh, north. It's on the same road, uh, and we'll be spending the last day of the, of the conference there, uh, followed by the dinner. So I do urge you to, to find out where you are. Um, and that's really, actually, that's the only practical thing I want to say, except tomorrow morning, um, we'll start uh, our first lecture at, at 10.30. Uh, I think it's Joanna here today, Joanna McGrath? No. No, not, okay. Well, Joanna McGrath, you said there were two McGraths, amazing. And uh, she'll be giving the opening presentation at uh, 10.30. Uh, but we'll have tea and coffee served from 9.30. So I wish you have a very good night, those who are staying for the rest of the conference, and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks so much indeed. Thank you, Andrew.